Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and with Atlanta captured, George Thomas will be headed for Nashville to defend it against the Confederate Army of John Bell Hood. With Atlanta captured, Sherman and Thomas were in a difficult situation, attempting to guess at what the Confederate Army would do now that it did not have to guard Atlanta. Furthermore, now the Union Army had to protect Atlanta and its own supply lines. Sherman advocated for a raid with his entire army to the Atlantic. Grant, Lincoln, and Thomas all suggested a cavalry raid instead and attempt to defeat Hood and the Army of Tennessee before launching so bold a plan. When Hood launched his own raid against the Union Army supply line in northern Georgia, it was decided to let Sherman execute his raid to the Atlantic Ocean. Sherman detached Thomas to Nashville because there were two scenarios that could play out. Hood would either follow Sherman or invade Tennessee. Thomas was to defend Tennessee if Hood decided to invade the volunteer state, or if Hood followed Sherman, Thomas was to chase after him. Thomas would have 14,000 men in David Stanley's 4th Corps and John Schofield's 23rd Corps with about 10,000 men. His force throughout the state of Tennessee numbered about 50,000, but only 25,000 were available for active duty against Hood. Sherman did order Andrew J. Smith's 16th Corps to come to Nashville from Missouri to help Thomas. Apparently, Thomas thought he would be doing light duty because he sent his nephew to New York to bring his wife to Nashville. Thomas would arrive on October 3rd, and Francis would arrive soon afterward. They didn't get to spend much time with one another as George was attempting to capture or disable Nathan Bedford Forrest and his cavalry. When Thomas received reports of Confederates on the Tennessee-Alabama border, he suspected it was a small raid, expecting Hood to pursue Sherman. It quickly became clear that this was the entire Confederate army moving into Tennessee. Thomas ordered Schofield's Corps and Stanley's Corps to delay Hood for as long as possible while he concentrated as many forces that were spread out throughout Tennessee to Nashville. He also needed more time for Smith's Corps to arrive. Over the next couple of weeks, Hood attempted to get in between Schofield and Nashville, and when he had nearly done so at Spring Hill, miscommunication between Hood and his Corps commanders resulted in the Union Army marching past them in the night. Schofield had destroyed his pontoon bridge when he retreated from Pulaski, Tennessee, so when he made it to Franklin, he had no way to cross the Harpeth River. He asked Thomas for a pontoon bridge, but Thomas was unable to get it to him. So Schofield ordered his men to entrench while he attempted to bridge the river. On November 30th, the Battle of Franklin took place, and the Confederate defeat crippled the rebel army. Schofield retreated north to Thomas and Nashville. When Schofield arrived, Thomas greeted him unenthusiastically, but congratulated him on a successful campaign. Shortly after Schofield arrived, Andrew J. Smith arrived with his 16th Corps. Thomas was so glad to see him that he literally picked him up in his arms and hugged him. Hood, in a sense, laid siege to the south of Nashville, building his own fortifications, hoping to get Thomas to attack him. After the victory at Franklin, Grant had ordered Thomas to attack immediately, but Thomas insisted that his cavalry which had been campaigning for two weeks and whose mounts were broken down, needed to be replaced first. When cavalry did arrive, he still did not act. The Lincoln administration grew concerned over his lack of action. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton wired Grant that Thomas seems unwilling to attack because it is hazardous, as if all war was anything but hazardous. If he waits for Wilson's cavalry to get ready, Gabriel will be blowing his last horn. At one point, Grant wired Halleck to replace Thomas with Schofield, but suspended the order when he received a message that Thomas had planned to attack that day, but a winter storm of snow and ice prevented him from launching the attack. Grant told him that he had sent the order, but he had suspended it on the condition that Thomas would attack as soon as possible. Thomas grew resentful of Grant for urging him to attack, especially when Grant had been stalled outside of Richmond. Grant had had enough and filled out the paperwork for replacing Thomas with Major General John A. Logan, who was without a command. He sent Logan to Nashville with orders that if Thomas had not attacked Hood by the time he arrived, then to take over command and attack Hood at once. A few days after sending Logan off, Grant decided to make the journey himself to Nashville. December 14th came around, and Thomas decided to attack the next day. In the pre-dawn hours of December 15th, Thomas checked out of his room at the St. Cloud Hotel, confident that by nightfall his front line would be far to the south. Although all of his army would be making a movement against Hood's entrenched battle line, it would be Smith's Corps that would be making the main attack against the Confederate left. 
General Steedman, commanding African American troops, got Thomas to agree for his troops to attack the Confederate right, although Thomas had little confidence in their fighting ability. The attack did not go according to Thomas's plan. Fogg delayed the attack, and because Hood had moved most of his men back to a secondary line, only skirmishers remained in the front line, so the artillery barrage did hardly any damage. Nevertheless, Thomas's troops broke through the first line and pushed the Confederates back from their main line, but were unable to capitalize on their victory because darkness covered the battlefield. Thomas learned from the prisoners taken that Forrest cavalry was not with the army, therefore he could assign a more aggressive role to his own cavalry. Thomas ordered the prisoners march to Nashville, and it would be African American soldiers who would escort them. Some of the prisoners balked at the thought of being guarded by African Americans. One man told Thomas he had rather die than be guarded by black soldiers. Thomas responded by saying, well, you may say your prayers and get ready to die, for these are the only soldiers I can spare. Thomas settled into his headquarters and sent a message to Washington, informing them of the victory. Everyone was elated, Stanton and his family cheered in their front yard, and Lincoln came out of the White House in his nightshirt, candle in hand, to read the telegram. Grant wired Thomas that, I was just on my way to Nashville, but now that he had the news of Thomas's splendid victory, he did not intend to go. Push the enemy now and give him no rest until his is entirely destroyed, Grant urged. Do not stop for trains or supplies, but take them from the country as the enemy has done. Much now is expected. Lincoln sent a telegram to Thomas stating, Please accept for yourself, officers, and men the nation's thanks for your good work of yesterday. You made a magnificent beginning. A grand consummation is within your easy reach. Do not let it slip. The next day, Thomas renewed the attack. It took a little while for all of his troops to get into position to attack at the same time. An orderly later recalled seeing Thomas sitting alone on a log outside of his tent with his elbow on his knee nervously running his fingers through his beard as he watched their progress. At 2.45 p.m., the Union Army attacked the eastern flank of the Confederate Army. Meanwhile, Thomas was having to settle a disagreement between Smith and Schofield, who claimed their troops were too weak to attack the fortified position. When Brigadier General John MacArthur informed the other generals that the Confederate position was weaker than previously thought, Thomas ended the disagreement and gave direct orders to both corps commanders to attack. The Union soldiers breached the Confederate line, and the rest of the line crumbled. It was a wonderful victory for Thomas, whose cavalry under James H. Wilson was pursuing the Confederates into the night. Thomas rode up to Wilson and shouted so loud that he might have been heard a quarter mile away. Dang it to hell, Wilson. Didn't I tell you we could lick him? Wilson later wrote that Thomas, who was famed as one of the most reserved and most dignified men, and who never used profane language, on this occasion, he said, dang it, with all the vehemence of an old dragoon. With the Confederate army on the run and his cavalry chasing after them, Thomas began to organize for a pursuit. 